Uh, I'm Todd Beauchamp. I'm a partner at, uh, at Allen and Overy, focused on payments and fintech. Um, and, and I guess if you could uh, each introduce yourself. Great. Hi, I'm Ryan Gilbert from Launchpad Capital. Um, we are full life cycle venture investors focusing on fintech, partnering with community banks. Hi, Jade Mandela of the Goldman Sachs Growth Equity Fund, $5.25 billion fund um, outside of Goldman Sachs. We do three sectors, fintech, enterprise tech, and healthcare, and I'm one of the lead fintech investors. And I'm Sarah Hinkfist. I'm with Bank Capital Ventures in from San Francisco. Um, we are the venture capital group within Bain Capital, so we're investing out of a $2 billion fund that goes from pre-seed all the way through, through pre-IPO, and I'm on the growth team, so focus on Series B and beyond opportunities within FinTech and application software. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, um, thanks, guys. Uh, we, we, uh, you know, we talked um, uh, earlier this week, um, and, and I think, you know, there, there's... Um, we've seen a lot of change, obviously, uh, a lot of turmoil. Um, it's had a negative impact on, on a lot of things um, and, and made for uh, an overall challenging environment. Um, I guess, you know, a, a couple of questions. One, um, you know, what, uh, what has that done to your approach to the market? And, um, you know, have you, uh, um, has, it, has it impacted your focus? And if so, how? Can I ask before we get started, I'm just curious from who's in the audience. So are folks um, with early stage companies, founders are working at early stage companies, show of hands? Okay, what about growth stage companies? Awesome, and then um, publicly traded or like incumbent banks or firms? Awesome, and then other investors? A few, okay, awesome. Um, thank you, it's just helpful to get a sense of who's around too. Sure, oh, uh, one other thing too. Um, all all uh, all statements are uh, individual views and not those of their firms. Um, so just to get that out there. <laughs> I wonder who that's for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Except for me. <laughs> um, since I asked a question of you guys, I can start with your question. Um, so in terms of how our approach to the markets changed, so I would say. Um, we have to recognize that the market itself has changed. And so we are responsive to that rather than um, changing like what it is. And so obviously the amount of capital that went into FinTech was much more than it had been in years past during 2021 and early 2022. And so what, what effect that had is that a lot of FinTech companies today are sitting on both very large balance sheets of cash um, and or they also have very high valuations. And so this is not, like the reset in the market is not unique to FinTech by any means, but it, given the dynamic of how much capital was invested in FinTech, and then also what we saw in terms of the change in the public market comps across FinTech, it's meant that the effect has been more specifically felt within FinTech. Um, and so as we look kind of across different spaces that we invest, and we look at commerce, FinTech, application software and the infrastructure and security. It's definitely the case that within the fintech market, things are slower on average because folks are waiting to come to market or I think we've seen a lot of insider rounds or bridge rounds so that companies can try to grow into their valuations before they come out for the next out, um, outside round. Um, and so then in terms of our approach, I would say it's much more relationship based. And so since I am a growth investor, Whereas my early stage colleagues, I would say they're seeing less of a change in terms of the pace of new companies. And if anything, there are actually more fintech companies that we're seeing being created now from folks who are leaving those big firms. Um, but on the growth side, it's recognizing that a company may not raise this year. They may not raise until early next year or mid next year. But what we're doing is actually spending time with that leadership team to understand what their priorities are, how can we be useful and helpful, and really build that trusted relationship. Because I think not just from the market changing, but also from SVB, there was this recognition that who you have around the table really matters. And so it's not just about getting the investors who give you the highest valuation, although that's nice if it comes along with people who you really trust and feel like can be impactful to the business on the top line too. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take it in a slightly different direction because I totally agree and have nothing to add, very relationship focused. I think the biggest shift has been the focus on business models, which sounds really, really basic. However, I think we as a cohort lost sight of the fact that you need an efficient business model that will at some point in the iteration of your life as a company generate cash flow, 
which was also a concept that we all seem to forget for a certain period of time. And so if you think about the business models that work, we often break them up into two very basic categories, direct to consumer, B2B. Within direct to consumer, right now I would say in FinTech, it's sort of fallen out of favor. And I think that's slightly punitive and unfair. The reason why it's fallen out of favor is that we as an industry, I'm gonna say it's all colloquially as a family, overfunded many direct-to-consumer businesses, and we basically subsidized business models that didn't generate payback on the marketing spend that was used to acquire a consumer. And so, in terms of our focus, we are less spending time on business models where it's taking 18 to 24 months to pay back for marketing for acquire a consumer. It doesn't mean that the fundamental problems, the gaps in offerings for consumers, for all across financial services, were magically solved. It just means that we are less accepting of, oh, growth will come in three years, or this company's gonna triple, or it's okay to pay back in three years. So that's on the direct-to-consumer side. On the B2B side, we're now very focused on who is your end customer. Are you a FinTech? Are you a legacy financial services company? If you're a FinTech, are you a early-stage seed business? Whereas we all know that just the likelihood of surviving is unfortunately a lot lower. Are you selling into a legacy business that probably is cutting budget and isn't investing in R&D? And so it's just asking, which these probably all seem like very simple concepts, but just going that next stage. And so then in, in the business model sense, you probably either want to be, if you're focused on a FinTech, you want to sell into ones that are well-capitalized, ones that are in, of course, all of our portfolios, right? <laughs> because they're growing and spending. And then if you're selling into a legacy financial institution, you probably want to be enabling cost cutting and efficiency, reduction of fraud and all of the various costs that would come into the business relative to, I want to help you launch a new business line, which is less likely to launch in this environment. Well, how do I beat that? Um, I've been doing this for 25 years as a founder and investor, and it just makes me remember how short our memories are and recollections. And we're in a cycle. We're either at the end of one cycle and the beginning of the other, or bottom or top. It's, it really doesn't matter, but our investment thesis, at least at Launchback Capital, is 10 years and beyond. We go in early, often precede seed, a little bit of A, and take the long view. And we really try and encourage our teams to recognize that doing a startup like this is a bit like sailing. When you're out there, the wind is the one thing you cannot control. The sail is your response to the wind. Use them. And you typically have three to get around. And those three sails that you have can be, in, in, in context here, can be described as your capital and the availability and the sources, your people, and your technology advantage. So those are three critical pillars that we focus on. I suppose in fintech, and particularly in lending, we also worry a lot about compliance and regulation, which is really uncontrollable. You need more hopes and fears and a little bit of prayer. But if you, if you think about the three sales, a lot gets through. And, and for us, not much has changed. From a time spent managing the portfolio, a heck of, of a lot has changed. We've had to respond every time a bank sneezed because of the impact of SVB and subsequently First Republic and others. We have 34 community banks as limited partners in our fund, so we want to be sure that they're in a good position and confident about our strategy going forward, and, and thankfully today they, they seem to be in, in, in good position. Um, and I'm really excited about where we are. I think the current turmoil or distress or, or windy days we're seeing presents a lot of opportunities for the future, for the next decade. But my clear message is if you're not in this for the long term, get out and do something a lot more short term. Thanks. So I guess, um, where, where are you seeing the opportunities? What's, what's interesting to you today? How has that changed, um, I guess, what's cold now, um, you know, from your perspective? Yeah, I guess, you don't want to offend anyone, of course. What I would say is um, what's exciting are opportunities that the risk reward makes sense. So for example, like lending is absolutely out of favor. But lending can still be an incredible business. I mean, we're at an entire conference that was born out of the birth of lending. But if you're going to be a lending company, then one, risk management should probably be fundamental to your operations. Two, you should probably have somebody in the management team that has actually built a lending business before. And three, you should be valued like a lending business. If you're taking equity capital and spending it on actual loans, that like you have to realize that's gonna impact the way that your equity is actually priced. So I'd say like in terms of areas that are totally out of fashion, I'd say you obviously spend a lot of time in insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't, but from what I've heard, 
<laughs> I'd love to hear your views I'd on that to market too, terms. because yeah. it feels like that's the analogy where there's probably still really good opportunity. Yeah. They just need to be priced off of the appropriate metrics. Yeah, I, I thank you, Jade. I can pick that up. Um, I would also emphasize one area she talked about as well on business model, because I think what happened, and this is exactly endemic to insurance, is that non-fintech investors came into fintech and priced companies on multiples that were not representative of actual um, dollars into the company. And so in the insurance context, for example, if you price on gross premiums, that's technically like the top line. But insurance companies, especially if they're operating as MGAs or agencies, are only taking a very small percentage as commission. And so that's actually the net revenue. Or the same thing with a payments company. You can have obviously a very large GMV but the actual percentage points that you're taking on every transaction are much smaller. And so there was a lot of mispricing that happened in the market because non-fintech investors saw what they described, what they called ARR, kind of pattern matching across SaaS, but misunderstood what it actually meant to the bottom line of the company, and then also misunderstood how these fintech companies actually trade at exit. So like a price to book value, for example, as relevant in insurance. Um, but on the insurance point, so, I actually, on the pockets of opportunity, I think there's huge, it, there's a huge market in places where a lot of people are overlooking the space today because it's gone out of favor. And so within the insurance space, commercial is um, a phenomenal opportunity. Companies, even if you're about to stop being a business, one of the last things you can stop paying is your insurance. There are incredible advancements now in the distribution of commercial insurance. So for example, embedded insurance within other commercial platforms, like within other software platforms, and offering risk mitigation techniques to then help that end buyer, that end small business to better um, manage their risk and then also buy the insurance or get the upside from it. And so we're kind of like at this really exciting precipice on, on that space. Um, another example would be within claims underwriting in the insurance market. And so it's a place where AI has a lot of opportunity, and especially with the new vision that's coming out now um, in Q3 from um, uh, OpenAI, there are huge opportunities to actually reduce the cost associated with um, the actual claims process and what that can do to transform the loss ratios within the, within the insurance industry. Um, so the, I, I don't want to talk more about insurance, but that's just like one example of how I think if you go from the headline and actually underneath and look at what the opportunities are, investors who are knowledgeable and have done their work are really excited to spend that deep time with entrepreneurs who are excited about really transforming those spaces. So, so every year around this time, I read the Berkshire Hathaway annual report. If you don't read it, read it. It's, it's, it's amazing what, what Warren Buffett's put together, and particularly page A1 of the report which talks about float and really explains how float and insurance is how they powered the growth of their empire over the past couple of years. Yeah. And I, I, it's, it, yeah. it's phenomenal yeah. what, what can be done and, and that just sparks so much ideation. So um, I hope I surprise you with, with what I'm excited about. I'm super bullish about insurance. I think there's a lot of opportunity in life insurance, particularly for regulated institutions and corporates. There's this concept of bank owned life insurance or corporate owned life insurance where trillions of dollars have been saved and accumulated over the years. I also love parametric, um, new types of products. For example, where I live in Oakland, California, if you come and visit me at my office and park your car outside, I'll take a bet with you that your car's going to be broken into. It's just the way it is. But wouldn't it be great if there was an insurance policy that paid you out so you, to do glass replacement? Um, standard carriers don't offer that, but I do think there could be good parametric offerings, which are a little bit less cynical than I am as an individual and underwrite across the map. Um, similarly, there's, given, given the economy and job loss, what are individuals doing in order to ensure they can pay their rent, pay other recurring charges in the event of unplanned job loss? Again, it's parametric, non-standard, and, and interesting policies being written, particularly backed by, by Lloyd syndicates. Um, similarly, I'm, I'm on the crazy side of the house, very excited about the mortgage markets. Um, I cannot believe that to the clock, every 10 years there's a headline, Wells Fargo lays off 1,000 loan originators. And a week or two later, J.P. Morgan lays off a thousand. What do these guys not understand? We're in a freaking cycle. And it's 10 years, and we see it time and time again. Um, and you, you spend hundreds of millions of dollars building out these mortgage origination platforms, bring on loaner offices, make them 1099s, offer them the world, but fire them as soon as the metrics go opposite. There must be a better way. And we're spending a lot of time looking at that, especially because people are still buying houses. And many of you as founders, if you want to buy a house right now and go to any of the primary banks and get a mortgage, good luck. 
because SVB is gone and, and First Republic's not going to back you anymore. So I think there are a lot of interesting opportunities to provide access to capital for people like us. So maybe let's start in this room and expand out and, and remember that, that the, the path to home ownership, the ability to climb the property ladder, does need capital support from our banks and institutions. The final point that I focus a lot on is wealth management. Things we don't really think about. Like, how many of you floss every day? Will you put your hands up? <laughs> I'm supposed to say yes. <laughs> Come on. Like, you've, got to, you've got to do better. I'm not going to ask how many of you had a colonoscopy if you're over 45, because I'm quite sure the numbers will be as dismal. But if ever any of you have sat down with a, with a, a wealth manager or a trust and estate planning attorney and filled out, or at least done your planning, your trusts and wills and estates, you get this huge freaking binder of documents that you've got to sign either with yourself, with your significant other, spouses, the odds that you've executed those documents, I say, are as bad as the odds that you've lost your teeth. And that should be improved because there are a lot of benefits that we as taxpayers and as investors, as, as individuals, and our families can achieve. So why don't we invest in better solutions? And there are companies out there that are doing phenomenal work like Trust and Will. If you watch CNBC in the morning, someone from Trust and Will is on selling their $175 product. But with generational wealth transfer and changes to our tax laws and estate caps over the next three years happening, we're going to see a massive change in the United States. So we want to back companies that are going to be part of that and also help all of us in this room participate as well and get those benefits. Thank you. Can I offer oh, no, sorry. one more space and then Jade can go? Um, we're really excited about the opportunity for digital payments to transform B2B payments. And so if you think about payments as being one of the first areas where innovation, like in the first wave of fintech innovation, payments definitely led. And there's more gross profit in payments fintechs than there are in any others. But a lot of them are coming still from consumer payments. And that's where we've seen most of the digitization happen. And so much more of the market share is in B2B. And so we really think about it as what are the, the software players that have adjacencies into those payments workflows within the B2B platforms. And so we're spending a lot of time on Office of the CFO. So that could be cash flow forecasting, FP&A tools, treasury management, and then also looking at procurement. And so all these places where you have this intersection of the accounts receivable and accounts payable systems. Um, so we're really excited about those areas. Yeah, I was just going to add on the wealth management theme, and that's an area maybe is less relevant to sort of this conference in this room, but I'd say has generally been less excited, less exciting to VCs. Um, and so we, you know, it's been a little slower, as you probably can imagine. And so we spent some time basically thinking about this concept of like the personal balance sheet. And we had enough time to basically map out, obviously you guys know what a company balance sheet looks like, or hopefully you've seen one. Um, Edgar, if you want to look at them in great detail, have some fun. But what we did was basically map out for the mass affluent consumer, like what did their personal balance sheet look like? I think we did it maybe in August. So like August of 2012, and then we mapped out this representative human in August of 2022. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at their assets, their liabilities, and actually like made up a fake, you know, okay, great. Um, they have XYZ loan, like maybe on the liability side, they had like a buy now, pay later loan, et cetera. They had a mortgage originated by someone more digitally native, but the liability side hadn't actually changed that dramatically. But on the asset side, there was a complete fragmentation of what they owned. So for people for, let's call it like a hundred K of assets up to a million, they now had the dirty word of crypto, mm -hmm. they had property, whether it was fractional or full ownership, um, they may have had different 401ks from different employers because as we all know the great resignation, people were changing jobs. Um, and so then we looked across sort of four key pillars, one of which was trust and estate planning. So basically across estate planning, across tax, across retirement and investing. How is there not a single plane of glass across those to actually understand? Because if I'm making any of those decisions, I don't have a comprehensive view of how well or poorly my crypto may have been doing or my property, et cetera. And we don't have an understanding of our exposure. Um, and so we're still looking for companies in that space, but because we had enough time to build our nice little graphic, um, if any of you guys are, would be, want to be on our graphic that we, or, you know, as a firm, don't really publish a lot of content, but it'll be on a slide somewhere within the walls of Goldman Sachs. Come, <laughs> come find me after. We'd love to meet more companies that are solving pain points in this space. Uh, so what are you seeing in terms of valuation and, and, and drivers there? <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> it's my question. Yeah, so I, I'm on a bit of like a manifesto on, on valuation lately, which, so, okay. I, I was trying to do some math with someone on my team this morning, and I'm horrible at mental math, so I'll probably get the numbers wrong. But if you think about all of the companies that we crowned as this 
silly term of unicorn over the last few years. As growth equity investors, our minimum return threshold, not to speak for you, but for us and maybe for yours is a little bit higher, is 3x. So that means that we need companies to exit for more than 3 billion. And when you factor in dilution, et cetera, let's call it like 3.5 billion. So to work backwards, most of these companies will actually exit on EBITDA. Mm -hmm. Again, I know I'm talking a lot about cash flow. It's really unpopular. But so if you're going to exit on EBITDA, you have to think about roughly what your EBITDA margins would be. Mm -hmm. So let's say 20%, which is roughly where most of the S&P 500 on a median basis is. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing yep. a billion of revenue, mm -hmm. a billion of revenue, you have 20% EBITDA margins. And if we think roughly median EBITDA multiple is somewhere in the, let's call it, to be generous, 15x. Yeah. We just got to 3 billion. Yeah. Yeah. So you're doing a billion of revenue to get an exit at 3 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, what you'll say is, but Jade, they're not growing. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, yes, you're correct. <laughs> but you can't grow at 100% yeah. in perpetuity or 200% or 300%. Yeah. So like that's, it's nerdy, but like that's what keeps me up at night because we're growth investors and yeah. we're at a minimum putting you know, 30 million of, of capital into a business. A lot of them skew larger and they need to basically find a billion of revenue. Sorry, so I only have problems, not answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I can talk a little bit more tactically about valuations if it's helpful. So I would say um, across the landscape, so from like a pre-seed and seed, like we're still seeing probably, like at pre-seed it's like six to 10 to 12, and then your seeds are like up to 20, 25. And then your A's are really getting into like 50 to 60. Again, this is all depending on how much traction you have, how strong is your team, like what's your product, I think like the areas that you went through, Ryan. Um, and then I think the B is really where there's such a wide variety. And part of that as well is because there are companies that are raising what's called a B, but it's really an A, or they're raising a B, but it's really a bridge, or it's really a C, or whatever. And so I think like this B round becomes this really problematic territory where it's not about this is what the market is for the B, but it's instead, I, frankly, it's, people are thinking more about multiples now. And so it's the multiple on your next 12 months revenue or next 12 months gross profit, depending on what your um, particular uh, business model is. And on that, I would say there was um, a recent report that came out where it was like 10X is the new 100X. And I think that's pretty accurate where people are basically pricing to 10x with more benefit given to really fast growth or strong unit economics or burn ratio efficiency and pulling back on that if you're not seeing that as well. But that's kind of become the new anchor point, I would say, within the B, Cs, and Ds rounds. So we've had a very busy first half of the year, and I'd say we put compression socks on everybody's valuation. <laughs> and um, you, know, we, you want to be younger? Well, come to me. I can make a Series B, a Series A very, very quickly. And it's unfortunate <laughs> that's what's been happening. Um, a lot of investors have just packed up, either gone to the beach or, or gone into study mode, um, which means there are fewer folks who are actually digging in and, and, and participating. And what I am happy to report is a lot of insiders are recognizing that in order to maintain the viability of these businesses, new money needs to come in, yeah. needs to reprice, and set appropriate terms. Mm -hmm. We've been doing a bunch of these over the, the two quarters. Three of our transactions were convertible notes. Not safe notes, but convertible notes. Mm -hmm. Very well written and very clear with respect to seniority. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we're not going to get pushed around. And that's for everybody's benefiting, especially the founding team. The other thing that we've been doing is on the earlier stage deals, whereas we have been in the camp that would have been in the 10 to 15 range previously for seed, we're now seeing 7 to 10 is that new, that new seed yep. valuation. What's keeping me awake at night is this concept of runway. How long? When are you next raising capital? And I really encourage 24 months. I think anything less is significantly dangerous. And my reason for that is simple. We cannot predict what this next year is going to bring. And when I listen to folks far smarter than me, like Jamie Diamond and others and people that work with you, no one knows. We don't know where capital is going to come from. We don't know what consumer behavior is going to do. But we do know that prices are going up, commodity costs are going up, cost of living is increasing. There's going to be significant unemployment that we haven't seen yet. Bad performance production-wise with second quarter results. And then we're missing our biggest ally in this industry, Silicon Valley Bank. So in the past couple of years, whenever I've done a deal, call up SVB, open your accounts, get a line of credit. Easy. That easy button's gone. And none of the successes to SVB, 
those who have hired their teams, have stepped up to say we're going to be there. They're emphasizing that they're humble. Well, of course they're humble. They were whacked over the head three months ago. You're going to be humble. But they also emphasize that we're conservative. Well, we don't want to hear conservative. We want to hear that because Ryan Gilbert's behind you on the deal, I'm going to come in with three million bucks. Those days are over. So I really encourage you, take equity, price it well, get runway, and recognize that you're going to be diluted. But do your job. You'll be re-upped in the future. That's the new solution. So good luck to all of us. Um, I guess, what, what advice would you have for, kind of keying off the, the second question there, what advice would you have for founders as they're, as they're kind of thinking about fundraising today? Make sure that your CAC is not crap for B2C. Please, understand your costs. And, um, and, and, and I think find ways to bring CAC as close to zero as possible, potentially through good additive distribution partnerships. Perhaps means that you're giving up a little bit of your margin to your partners, but perhaps you can also build better products together. And I think everyone's trying to figure out a better way to acquire customers and, most importantly, a better way to thrill the customers, to keep them longer. And then we all win. So if I generalize this question a little bit from just B2C, I think one thing I would mention is how important it is to talk to the right people. And so I do think investing firms are um, separating in terms of the type of deals that they're looking at. And the firms that you've been talking to in the past may not still be relevant for where you are or what you need at the next stage. And so being willing, like when you're on a call and you're getting questions about how the business is doing and what the update is, also asking the investor about that as well. So what are you looking for for me to get to the next stage? Like what are the metrics that you're comping me on? Like, what are, like um, who are the companies like me that are at the next stage that you would imagine I would look like? And I think that's important because there are some firms who used to be growth investors and have totally pulled out of the market, and they've just gone back to early stage. There are some who had traditionally done venture growth, like a lot of crossovers, and they've pulled back into like the place where they've been before. And there are some that have gone the other direction where they had been doing some venture growth, and now they're doing more mid-market private equity with like control deals and structured transactions. And any of those like could be the right thing for you, like to Ryan's point, to raise capital, like to survive and persist through the, to the next cycle, but to, to not spend time with the wrong people because that's super costly against all the other objectives that you have. Yeah, and a small add on there is if you do have a VC pass on your investment, ask them for detailed feedback. And so like the classic example is like people will say, your gross margins are too low. And that's an example we give Kendley all the time. What I love is in this environment, I'm getting back, what is the gross margin, target gross margin that you would invest at? Put us on our toes. And that's great because then by the way, if we've done the real work, yeah. like, you know, we have an army of associates that have already built out that model. I can tell you exactly what the 2026 gross margin forecast is like in the model. And so it's like, then actually I'm helping you and adding value. And so I would say like put investors on the spot, give to give feedback. And if you're not getting that, you know, obviously that feedback will, will come around, but like specific metrics, if they use something, tag onto that and ask like the follow up question. Where are you seeing um, the biggest missteps um, today? I think if you're not going to do things that are complicated and difficult, you're making a massive mistake. And the reason why I say that is complexity requires learning and study and, and investigation, and then gives you the superpower of knowledge that hopefully others in the same space don't have, and you can use that to execute. It means that you actually have to invest a significant amount of your own personal time and interest in becoming that expert. If you can pull that off, that's a critical advantage, which as an, an investor, I value more highly than anything else because I know, well, you are the smartest person in the room. And I'd love to learn. I'd love to talk less. I remember I've got two ears, one mouth. I need to use it in that proportion. And that builds confidence and also helps you get out there and to an extent also answer the very questions that we're going to have. So be prepared. I love it when folks walk into our room or at least send a, a, a meeting memo ahead of time saying, this is our investment memo. Well, great, you're trying to do my job for me, or you're trying to you know, steer the jury, but at least you're I trying to be thoughtful. I love that. I love that, yeah. yeah. Same, same question. Um, biggest missteps that you're seeing? Um, I, I still think there is stigma around the down round. Um, I think it's starting to dissipate, which is really good, but I think there's stigma around it, and I think that's holding people back. Um, because um, 
getting a down round with the right set of investors could be better than getting the round at the valuation you want with investors that aren't as strong for your, like for where you are, for the space, for the types of customers that you're trying to sell into. So I think it's, it's really around optimizing for the investors you want around on the table. I like this, this, uh, this latest question. Um, how do you balance move fast, break things with the increasing regulation um, and, and general concern about poor foundations? Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, so I'm not afraid of, of investing in heavily regulated businesses. Um, I have the joy of filling out, if any of you guys know, the NMLS forms. I get my fingerprints done all the time for being on the boards of companies that do that. I think the key is, and this is very tactical, but hopefully it's helpful, like getting a really great general counsel and doing it early enough in the life cycle of the company and someone that's commercial that can take the right risks. And then the second thing would be being in lockstep with your board or your investor, or if, if you only have one, you don't have a full board yet, on what are the risks that you're comfortable taking and then what are you not. So I think like being over communicative because you can put your investors on the spot. I have one of my companies that basically is like, this is the risk. We could either overly comply in 50 states, it'll cost us X million dollars, and the risk is probably like as low as 10%. And like we are in the risk business. Sometimes you have to take those risks, but being very transparent about what they are and having an incredible general counsel early on actually really can help enable that. So don't take personal risk though. Yes. Like there's lots of people Agreed. who are like, what's it, the Forbes 30 under 30 or 40 under 40 and then you get sued by JP Morgan when you sell your company to them. <laughs> Please don't do that. So stay away from that publication and stay away from that. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's come on, three times in a row, the data's I there. declined to answer. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, actually not talking for Goldman Sachs. But the, in, in this, this is a conference about lending. Usually laws are often very, very clear. You, you, you know it when you see it. Don't mess up on that one because you are too easy a target for your regulator. It takes a couple of hundred complaints to the BBB, one negative news article that somebody in the capital of your state is going to come after you. And that kills the whole model. And your board members should know better than that if this isn't their first rodeo. And you should certainly know better than that. Listen to counsel, do appropriate, but also do what's right. And I, I just want to double click. Usury is the Achilles heel of this industry at this conference. So if I can combine the move fast break things with the generative AI piece. Sure, so I'll please. get two questions in for you. Yes. Um, so when I have conversations about generative AI within financial services, a lot of times the pushback is, well, it's not allowed, we can't do it, there's all this data security, like all the regulatory concerns. And I can't encourage enough finding ways to play within the sandbox in a way that is comfortable for whatever institution you're in, because that is what everyone else is doing and has to be done to find the areas of opportunity. So I think at the top of the generative AI hype cycle, where I actually think, fortunately, we're coming down from. But at the top of it, it was like, it's gonna be the saving grace for everything, it's gonna make everything so much easier, and things will be cheaper, and you know, all, like there was this- Everybody flosses now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like there was this huge opportunity, and, and that's still true, but we're now getting into the really fun productivity phase where we're figuring out what are the specific types of um, processes where it's well applied and can actually unlock new value or can make things cheaper or make things faster. And the only way to find that for your organization is by being in that sandbox and playing. And so I've seen a lot of creative solutions to this. Like could be just using the core LLM, not doing fine tuning on the data, which by the way, your own data, which is so much more expensive anyway, or customer data. It could be instead having prompt engineering rather than the fine tuning to still get most of the way there for the effect of what it would be. It could be using it only within internal use cases and not customer facing until you find more comfort with the customer facing side. But I, it, from our perspective, it's, it is a missed opportunity to not get your hands dirty and figure out what works because the best companies are doing that today and it will be something that eventually all companies will be integrating. Um, oh, quickly uh, from each of you, what are, your, what are your thoughts next six to nine months? Where do things go? <laughs> I think we're gonna have a massive problem on re in recruiting with work from, from home and, uh, and lack of work. Um, I'm very worried about the incoming class of graduates from college who are being told by their bosses, as my son was recently told, oh, it's um, remote preferred. We, we are in on Thursdays. 
<laughs> my response to Daniel was, get another job, because you don't want to be in these environments. So really, ask yourself in your businesses what you're doing to bring in new recruits. Most people say we're not hiring first and second year college grads. You've got to have those programs. That's where the advantage is going to be, because otherwise in two years out, there's going to be a massive gap. So I think people are a problem. I think hopefully you're actually going to see an uptick in new business formation of a lot of fintech companies. I think you're going to have a lot of really smart engineers at these later stage fintech companies that they look at their equity, it's unfortunately underwater or just completely different from the financial picture that they were promised when they joined. They're going to spin out, start their own companies. First you'll fund them, then we'll fund them, um, and then the ecosystem will grow. And I, I do think what's interesting is the new businesses will be less correlated to the macro because when they're just doing listening tours and understanding the problems, there's no reason why you can't actually start incredible companies in a very tough macro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we're already seeing that too. Like our early stage team, to your point, has been more active than they've ever been in this market too. Um, and then maybe the only thing, other thing I'd add is I do think that we're going to see a breaking of kind of the stalemate of sorts around funding and like the valuation environment. And I think... Um, the pragmatic mind of like, how do I get to the next stage and how do I keep providing value to my customers with the right partners around the table who will actually help me grow the business that I want it to be, that's gonna win out. Um, and so I'm really excited for that as well. All right, well, that's it, I think. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you everyone, thank have you. a good evening. <laughs>